want to tell us. Particularly, we are all contemplating the theme, God's best for us. So in that line of thought, this particular psalm came to my mind over this, towards the end of this week. So I thought I would just share with you a few thoughts. Before we go, maybe just bow our heads. Father, we just want to commit all our hearts and minds into your, in your presence for your care. Help us to concentrate on what you are going to tell to us through this word, through this still small voice that you are going to speak in our hearts today. Help us to hear you and provide us opportunities and grace to obey you, Lord. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. One of the reasons why I chose this particular song uh, uh, is this one. Almost all of us know it by heart. This is not a new psalm. This is the most beloved psalm in, in the Christian world. About five years ago, I was in New Delhi in India. There I met a man who is a secretary of a, to a big mission agency. I asked him, how did you become a Christian? He told me, I come from a shepherd caste. I do not have deities in that he knew of who loved shepherds, who himself was a shepherd, but he loved the shepherd, shepherd people, the shepherds, cow herds, goat herds, horse herds, camel herds, and then he said, that is why I became a Christian. And he left his family and, and then is doing his work in New Delhi. That's one, one reason. The second reason is, when Christianity was brought to Europe, say around 4th and the 5th century, around 1,500 years before our time, so long is Christianity in, the, in, 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 in Europe. Lot of herders, goat herders and lamb herders, lamb, they became Christians. What might be the secret? I assume this is the sound with which they could relate themselves. Great theology is good. It is a mental exercise. But how do you relate it to my day-to-day -day work? It is the Psalms like this. It's the cry of the heart, where you get rid of your emotions. And our sister was telling, you know, endochronology, how the hormones should work. This Psalm can help us. Because good attitude creates good conditions. And good conditions create opportunities for us to seize the moment and work for God. Perhaps today there may be some such opportunities. So I thought we will go step by step. How do I? How do I? First, we will see the meaning of the word shepherd. It is associated with sheep. That's why we call it shepherd, the person who tends the sheep. Usually a hireling, you do not hear the owners telling I am a shepherd. Generally not so, but it's a hireling. And it is also a symbol of trust and confidence, care and protection, particularly in times of need. But why do people raise sheep? Well, in England, to keep the forest fires out because they nibble and they keep the forests clean. And they also keep the mountains beautiful, isn't it? And they manure them because of their gentle steps on the slopes. The, the earth becomes airy and they can breathe well. There are many side products to that. But ultimately they raise sheep so that we all can have mutton. <laughs> Good meat. Good meat. If it is not available in this country, then you import it from New Zealand or elsewhere. It's a good meal. It nourishes. It nourishes. That's one of the reasons too. But in the, in the course of time, sheep has been very, very helpful. But it is the symbol of trust, confidence, care, protection, obedience, and all you can tell. It is also, friends, a metaphor for those who have the duty of care, anybody. It can be the pastor, it can be the church leaders, it can be the parents, 
It can be the elder sisters, elder brothers, anybody who has the duty of care. It is a symbol, including kings and everybody else. And that is the one that we often miss, the duty of care. Not only personally to me, you cannot, I, I should take care of myself, each of us. But at the same time, duty of care is goes beyond me. That is, that is the place where this psalm makes us selfless. Or it propels us to go beyond ourselves. In the Bible, biblical world, what is the meaning of shepherd? Why should David, for example, grab this metaphor and use it? Every religious tradition in the world has that symbol, shepherd. Major religions have it, particularly in the, in the biblical world, it was Babylon, where people went for exile, or in Egypt, where Moses and others were raised and brought back. They knew that their kings called themselves shepherds, Marduk, the moon god of Babylon, and Ra Aton Ra, the sun god of ancient Egypt. They called themselves shepherds. And the ancient kings particularly called themselves with a special appellation. So for example, Homer, that's the first time in Greece, in Greek, we come across that word, shepherd of the people. And oftentimes these gods who consider themselves shepherds thought of themselves as representatives of their deities themselves. In other words, they are the embodiment of God. So they, they are taking up the divine beauty to protect the people. So, as shepherds, they symbolize authority, confidence, feeling, and solving the needs of the people. Well, did they really do? No. <laughs> no. This is the ideal they set to themselves. But we know from the history of the politics, it is the rulers, they have their own agenda. Mm. They will speak in the name of the people. Yep. But oftentimes there are, agen there are rules and regulations. We do not question them. Mm. But behind it, there are other motives. The only place where we will see that kind of boundaries transcending will be the places where, like this, Temple of Praise, uh, where the community of believers come together at the, at the ground level. It is necessary to set good policies. But the policies must work where, as you say, the wheel hits the road. That is the place where we need to be. In the Old Testament, we have several instances where the, the metaphor of shepherd is being used. Cattle feathers were the Israelites. When Jacob and his children go to Egypt, that's what they tell, we are shepherds. Nobody wants us. We are the lowest of the low. In other words, we are excluded. See, when Jesus takes up that symbol, one thing is royalty, but in the practical mind, people did not have that royal opinion at all. These were the shepherds. They looked down on them. But slowly and steadily, these references show us for the biblical mind, for the Old Testament people, these were very well-known images. We have here few, Exodus and the Exodus event. In Samuel and Kings, we have these references that you can, you can read. It is above all else, is the Exodus event that imprinted in the mind of the Old Testament people that God is shepherd. In the impossibility of the desert, God guided them. I need, I need to know the art of doing it. <laughs> then it will really help me. I, I'll point towards that. Good, thank you. So this particular psalm, we already read, I read it. I draw your attention to the fourth verse. Do you see that something is written above? Maybe it is too small to read, but in your Bibles you can, you can read. In the manuscripts, in the Hebrew manuscripts, uh, the word valley of valley is there, but not of death. It's not that. In, in many authoritative ones, that, that's the thing. But darkness, 
shadow it is there. So in the, in the course of time, people have understood it is a valley of death. But valley of darkness, yes, valley of shadow, it is definitely there. What are some of the textual observations? There are three types. The first two verses tell he, God as he. See, I put that word God, Yahweh, because I believe the English word God is too elastic. <laughs> you can put anything into it and take out anything. It means different things for different people. That's why it is very good. In interreligious dialogue, you can always say, did you mean that really? I say, no, I don't, but still it's God. So you can put in and take out. But when it, when it is associated with personal names, then it is not. Then it is very specific. That's why I just put God, Yahweh. People read it, Yehovah, right. or Yahweh. We do not know how it was pronounced. So the verses, the first three verses portrays God, Yahweh, as the shepherd and addresses him, he. He, somebody who is in front of me. But then, what brings that he in my life is verse 4, troubles in life. As a wanderer, as a real living human being, we face it. And then the fifth verse, again he, but it's a different role, God as a host. The title of the psalm is very interesting one. We say it is Psalm of David. It is true, it is really Psalm of David, but in the real it is melody. That's how it is written there. Miss Moore, La David, the melody of the most beloved. The, because the name David or David means the beloved. That's why. It is the melody of the beloved. It's the dear one. It's the dear one. So making melody is itself is a song. I'm sure that this afternoon you are all going to the stadium to sing and may your song be also a great melody for people to, to come and listen. Amen. <laughs> Verse 1. The Lord is my shepherd. I thought I will follow this way. I'll give the, the new uh, NIV translation on the top. And below, I will give my own version of it, how I thought the Hebrew read. My Hebrew is limited. I do not know much. But from what I can make out, this is what I think the, the, word, the verse tells us. Since the Lord is shepherding me, nothing diminishes for me. That's how it is there, really. Our translators put it, I like nothing. The focus is not about me here. The focus is it's about the Lord Yahweh. Friends, I, I also shared with you earlier the meaning of the word. What is, when, when Moses asked God, what is my name? God tells, tell Yahweh. But we know that word comes in Genesis, Genesis chapter 2, for the first time. But Moses is in Exodus chapter 3. I am who I am. That's how you would all have been hearing it in the past. But I believe that particular name of name means give God an opportunity to discover God in a fresh way, in a new place. Every place God will reveal himself, or God's self in a new way, or fresh. That is why God never becomes old. God is always present, is. That's the meaning of it. In every situation, God reveals himself differently, provided we have eyes and ears and hands to feel and to discover. That's it. And the, ver and the, and the verb is not, in the English translations, it puts into noun, shepherd. It's not like that. It is verb. The Lord is shepherding me. It's not as a noun, as an inactive person somewhere else, shepherding me actively. That is why nothing is decreasing in my life. Mm -hmm. We may think it is decreasing, but the moment we discover God's presence in our life, it becomes again increasing. 
we discover God. Maybe that's, that's the word. Verse 2, it means, He makes me lie down in green pastures, and He leads me beside quiet waters. This is how in the, in the Hebrew, it, the emphasis lies. In pastures green, He makes me lie down. How does he do that? By bringing my chest to touch the ground. Great imagery, isn't it? How many of you have seen a cow trying to lie down? Mm. Or a horse, or an elephant, or a dog? It doesn't jump and lie down. It slowly does it. Slowly does it. And it nicely bends down. Mm. What is the meaning of it? Quieten yourself down. You cannot lie down in hurry. If you do, then you break your knee or bone, something else, or some strain will happen. Do it slowly. In other words, slow down. Life is there to enjoy, not to hurry up and waste so many things. I know our timetables are full, calendars are full, and so many activities do you have. In spite of all modern washing machines, cooking gadgets, telephone, this and that, do people have time? No, they will say no. And it tells to the quiet and calming water resting place. Where there is water, there's a quiet waters. It's a resting place. Take rest. He leads me carefully. This is the word where. There are two places in English where the word comes, he leads me. But this is the one, he leads me carefully. You know, before I began to study theology, I was a farmer and we had a cow. And we had to lead the cow very carefully. It's big, it's much bigger than it was at that time. With one step, I, I could have been crushed. But we have to take care of the cow, so we will know if we go this way, it will not slip for her, taken a different way. Amazing imageries. That's why the Bible makes all the more sense, because it's down to earth. Verse 3. He refreshes my soul, he guides me along the right path for his name's sake. I thought, the Hebrew here brings out a lot more information than that is available in plain English. Much more. This is only one attempt. My soul, it begins, my soul. A proper way would be also to say, my life, he returns to me. Not merely restores. See, the shaded ones, what I have here, throat, neck, breath, life, Personality, individuality, all of them can mean in that one word, nephesh. When it comes to the Greek, deep, these people put it psyche, suche. That is the word for psychology. That is the word for breath. And that is the word for life. And God restores it to me. And then you see the word shub, I have written there. Shub really means turn around. In other words, that is the word also used for conversion in the Old Testament. So God converts my life. Isn't it an amazing picture? Restores. Yes, we can restore. Who can restore? Medical doctors. I know, sure, there are many of you here in the medical field. You can restore a sick body back to health. They can say we can do mechanical uh, repairs to your limbs. And then you can all do that. Yes, it is one side of the story. It is giving it back. Mm. It's an amazing thing. When people think our life is lost and God presents it back. Amazing thing. And then leads me on the paths, well-trodden tracks of righteousness is the word. It is a heavy word. It's a big word in the Old Testament. <coughs> big, important theological word. But you see, the meanings are very straightforward sometimes. It is, he restores me back to normal life. The life that we have to live. Because the moment it tells you how to live a righteous life, sometimes we are afraid. We do not know how to do that. Which rules and regulations we have to follow. Whose example we should follow. 
Friends, the Bible says, get back to your normal life. Normal life in relation to God, in relation to one another. It's a beautiful verse. And right, successful, and finally, I put the word grace-filled life, but that word sadik can also mean grace. Grace-filled life, gracious, gracious life. Beautiful, for the sake of my name, my name. Again, the word name means my standing in society. That is what a lot of people are afraid of, isn't it? They can quarrel at home, but when they say, what will people tell me I may lose my face? That's a lot of people are afraid of that. Losing face or losing one's position in the society. What may neighbors might think of? Standing, reputation, renown, and memory. The memory is also a, particularly of people who have gone ahead of us. The memory of our ancestors. They may, you may have heard, I do not want to damage the reputation of my family. This is my family value. These are memories. But see, God, as a living person, has also all these things. He tells, I take care of you as, as creatures, as my sheep, because I made you. And my son Jesus Christ died for you. And the temple of praise exists for you, with you, along, along beside you. That is why these are all so very important friends. For my name's sake. So, fourth. Even though I walk through the darkest valley, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and staff, they comfort me. Oftentimes we may think again, I walk only in one direction. But in life it is not like that. The word kalak means walk to and fro. Okay. Front and back and sideways. That's what we do, isn't it? Every time. It is not in a straight line our path goes. There are always zigzags. There are always shortcuts. But often times in my, in my experience, shortcuts become a long cut. <laughs> if you would ask my family to tell me, Daddy took us on a shortcut, ah, they will all tell, no, no, that's never the case. Maybe you all have that experience. What we think shortcut may become troublesome afterwards. <laughs> very difficult, unless you are very, very experienced. It's not the shortcut thing. It is walking still. Yeah. Even though I walk halak. I fear no evil. I do not know whether how many in languages the word kaka, kaka, is there in, in that day? Does that ring any bell? Kaka is the feces of humans. In Greek, in Septuagint, that is the word that is used there, kaka. And in our language, we use it for human feces. So when we talk about evil, it stinks. It is a waste of humans. The human body does not need it. But it is as if human beings would be returning to the feces. That is what evil means. See, when we read it only in English, these kind of hidden meanings, the depth of meaning does not come to. It, so evil, it means protecting the human feces. It can have several other manifestations, but at the root, it is a waste product, and it's a stinking product. It can be converted into fertilizers if you want to, but it takes processes. It is not everybody's business. Only specialists can do with that. Not ordinary people, you and I, we cannot do. And in the shadow of the mountains, see the valley is a deep. Here in Liverpool, we do not have a mountain, so we cannot, but you can go near a skyscraper perhaps. Immediately in the shadow, you feel cold. It is not warm. Even on a sunny day, it will be, warm. It will be cold. 
when we walk near that, in that strand. But in the hill country, it is common. Where you walk down and slowly, it may be sunny upstairs, but with the moment you come down, it becomes dark and cold, very uncertain. Mm -hmm. And this is the imagery that David is using. Probably in his time of fighting, in his time of shepherding, he may have gone through all these things, all these parts, shadow, in the darkness. I fear no evil because you, Atta, you know in Arabic, Atta is the word that the wife calls the husband. Atta, you. That it means father. My fatherly figure. My protector. That's what it means, Atta, you. But in Hebrew it is plain you, you. You are with me, you are rod and staff, they comfort me. It's the prodding one. It's the feeding one, protecting one in times of animal dangers. The fifth. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Amen. This is again such a beautiful imagery, friends. Mm -hmm. Not in the absence of problems, God's presence is felt. Mm -hmm. Not when everything goes well. Mm -hmm. That will be only in heaven probably. Mm -hmm. But we as human beings face challenges at every turn. Yeah. Every turn. In our normal life, here when we are sitting in this protected place, it's a blessed place. But go to the streets. It's a different world. Everywhere we face challenges. And in that midst, God is present. That, that is the meaning here. Amen. Enemies, it tells. It is a heavy word. It is those people who make my life difficult. <laughs> we may think the enemies are far, far away, not in my sight. <laughs> It may be, it may be those who are producing, for example, systemic decisions make, mm -hmm. trade decisions. Mm -hmm. One country doing trade with other other country. Mm -hmm. And that will definitely affect us. It is one way those who afflict us, <laughs> human beings. In other words, it may be at home. Mm -hmm. Most often, it is the most the beloved people with whom we are living. They are those who make the life difficult. <laughs> no, if it is a stranger, our life will cross. You go this way, I go this way. If it is in a family, we walk parallel. <laughs> there is no traffic line to say, you go this way, I go that way. It is one way you go. And the frictions is not easy. But the word of God tells God is present Amen. even in that midst of that misunderstanding, troubles, and whatever it may be, yeah. not in his absence. <coughs> and he anointing me with oil. See, the word oil is semen. Semen. It is a symbol of being fed, taken care of. It means fattening up. And our sister was telling today, I need to just ask her later on. They, they say you fight diabetes with good fat, with good oil. It also means like that, taking care. The last verse. Surely your goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Amen. In English, the power of the word is somehow weak. <laughs> you see that? You see that word. Goodness, it is the word tov. You know, in, the, in, the, in Genesis chapter 1, when God created everything, God sees everything is good. Yeah. It is the same word that it does. It's a creative word. In God's sight, the creation is good. You and I are good. That's what he does. Same thing, goodness. And steadfast love, it is a powerful word. 
very seldom translated correctly because there is no compatible word in any language. Only we have to be content with imperfections in this case. He said, loyalty, faithfulness, kindness, and then did you see that next word? Can we all read that word? Obligation to community. When we say, when we sing love and love, it stops with me. God loves. No, God loves me for the sake of community. God, here in our context, God loves me for the sake of temple of praise. For the sake of each other. It, it has the communal impact. Has it? The love, thy loving kindness is better than life. That we all sing. That's the same word, has it? It's there it's that in, in the middle. What does that mean? S having said all these all this things, there are four instances where Jesus is called the shepherd. There are the four instances where Jesus is called the shepherd. First in John 10, 11, I am the good shepherd. We know that. We often tell, think about it. It's a great chapter to read. But friends, we need to remind ourselves that particular book of John was written 100 years or 70 years after the death and resurrection of Jesus. So that word, I am the good shepherd, has gone through three generations of testing and then only John writes it. Had he not realized it, he might not have written it. I am a good shepherd. Then Peter, he tells the shepherd and overseer of our souls. Mm. And then in Hebrews, we have that I am the he's a great shepherd. And in Revelations, also he tells that at the throne there will be shepherd. So the imagery of shepherd and Jesus takes it to a greater heights. What are some of the lessons? What shall we say? Which God? <laughs> you can read for yourself, I thought. It is Yahweh for the Hebrews, okay, but how do you, what can you do with the Hebrew God? It is not possible because if, as an innate human being, people with feelings, people with the histories, memories, it is very difficult to, to relate to a God whom you do not yet know in your own language. That's why curios, the Greek people thought curios, that is the word for emperor, that is the word for God, their God. Imperfect, but still, they used it. Cut there, that's what we do, the one who does it. Then Nigeria, I thought, I wanted to also find out in Ghana and other few other African languages, but the other Asian languages, I did not have time, so I just stopped with Yoruba. <laughs> Yoruba. <laughs> and you think about the legend that goes with that word, Yoruba. What the pride our Nigerian friends have it with that name. And how many names are with having that word, Oluwa or Olu? So in other words, that's why I thought when we use the word, God becomes a native. He's not a foreigner anywhere. He's God's word. So God is here. So linguistically, culturally, historically, God has not distanced himself from this world. Even though there was a time in, in the European and North American history, they thought God is dead. <laughs> you know, Nietzsche, the German philosopher, it was he who said, God is dead. And people still think some God is dead, God is irrelevant, but no, God is native. God is present. Amen. God is not dead. Amen. He is local and he is here. Amen. Only we are the newcomers. <laughs> and we will also pass. That's right. As pastor was telling, our time is limited, so best thing is just make use of best, best of the time. So, we said, not in spite of, not without the problems, in spite of the problems, what, what are some of the most modern problems? I just, uh, just put, these are, they think, oh no, mm -hmm. that was too fast. Mm -hmm. They think, just came to my mind, some of them. 
we are living in a well-ordered life, society. You see, there is a law for everything, nearly everything. Only for some scientific discoveries, there are not yet law. Apart from that, you turn right, there is a law. You turn left, there is a law. Go forward, there is a law. Go behind you, everywhere, there is a law. But do they, are they implemented? That's a different matter. But we are more, we are living in a most regulated and most informed and most developed world. But none of them have made, made the world more humane. In comparison to the past, yes. But in comparison to our expectation, modern expectation, they are not. A lot of people are not sure whether they will reach their homes well, particularly in places like London. There is fear. There is distrust. Not merely the video cameras that are watching us around. So many people are watching us. Whether it is a credit card company, or phone people, internet people, mobile unit, you see, everywhere they, they, know, they watch us. In spite of that thing, there are more dangers in the world. Modern evils lurk in the most familiar places and among most familiar people. They're not in faraway places. Girls and boys. Recently, I was watching a debate in India. How do you create a better society? They were debating. It was mothers and fathers. It, they said, school is the problem, society is the problem. But one mother stood up and said, raise your boys well at home, that the girls in the street will be safe. So making the home a good place for children to grow up. The second one is even worse, loneliness. You may have seen some of the most recent BBC panorama, where people driven by loneliness and looking for online friendships, how much they are duped. Because that is a great sickness in the modern society. Loneliness, indifference, isolation, and lack of respect for one another and for lack of purpose. When we are traveling in the bus, or in the tube, or anywhere else, we can see that. They will say, even a young boy or a young girl, they don't say anything, hey, don't do it. Or whether it is smoking, or, or they are, some of them stink because they smoke something else. Mm. Very difficult. We are living in a world. But what does this psalm mean for us, particularly? Unrealistic promises and expectations in families and lack of forgiveness and give and take situations. Sharing. I, I know when, when I got engaged to my wife, <laughs> that was long, nearly 31, 30, no, long time ago. <laughs> 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 My principal wrote a letter to me that he said, you practice two things, he said. One thing is different, the word, another one I'll say, love and forgiveness. When that is lacking, friends, the families will not be families. The house may be there. But the heart won't be there. So there won't be laughter. There won't be joy. What does the psalm tell? You see, you, you lead me to my normal life, the life of righteousness. That's what that should happen. Lord, lead me to the life where it will be where it will be normal for me. You can take attitude. One more, then we will close. So what shall we say? I just put this one. 
God our way, who allowed himself to be discovered afresh in every new situation of the Israelites, is still God. Let us discover him in our own life context. Mm. Each life context is different, but God is the same. May we discover this great God afresh. And God Yahweh shepherds us and prepares a table for us, not in the absence of, but in the midst of evils. I thought that insight is greatly strengthening me. We are not looking for a perfect world. We are moving towards it. We may not achieve it in our life. Our past generations have not. Probably we will not. But we can leave behind a world that is slightly better, slightly more humane than what we, you and I have inherited it. And that will be something great. Yes, something great. The images of pasture, water, oil, wine, table, remind us of God's general provisions and his special persuasive invitation to our participation. Amen. They are there. But do we participate? Do we claim it for myself, mm -hmm. for ourselves? The word table is very interesting. It is not the one where we sit and eat. In the olden context, it is the skin people roll out on the floor to eat, sit and eat. That's for common people. The table is reserved for kings and royalties. Or for sacrificial purposes in the temples. That's what the table means. But look here in the Psalms, it tells he rolls out the table, he prepares the table. Not one table, but in rows. That's what the Hebrew implies there, allows it to me. And Yahweh's goodness and his hazard are not merely personal and private. They are, but they are not only. They remain relevant for communal life, first in our homes and families. And the sisters and brothers sitting in the temple. <coughs> There I would like to just conclude with a brief moment of silence. And it's God's word for us today. Psalm 23, the most beloved psalm. May it also become a most beloved one so that this coming week may be a week that we are filled with God's strength where we can say, the Lord is my shepherd and nothing decreases in my life. Mm -hmm. Let's pray. Father, as we